Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Um, thank you for logging in and listening to us. I'd like to find with something very familiar to us, and that is the state industry at the moment, surrounded by allegations of corruption and um, theft, basically. And people are very upset about it. And our, the lenders and people who are lending the money to Eskom have insisted that the government puts in a credible board of experienced people to run this operation if they want the lenders to roll over the money which they have lent to Eskom. That is essential. If the government is to avoid having to repay this 200 billion, then those loans have to be rolled over. And of course, Eskom is not the only state-owned enterprise in this predicament. Others are the big, next biggest one, I think, is the trans uh, Tunnel Authority. And they, there the government has guaranteed about 26 billion rand. Uh, also Denel, uh, South African Airways, we're very familiar with the situation there. Fortunately, it looks like a new board of credible people has been put in place there. And the post office, which is also a major borrower from the government. Okay, so... The lenders are insisting on proper boards, and but the funding of these entities is obviously a major cause of that 51 billion rand shortfall. The second problem, of course, is in SARS itself, in, this, in the revenue uh, department, where collections have been falling off. Ever since SARS came under the control of Tom Moyani, and Robin Gordon was removed from that role, Collections have been diminishing, and South Africa is in danger of not being able to collect sufficient tax from its people. Uh, part of that problem is that tax rates are quite high in this country, and so it obviously pays businessmen to spend time looking at how they can minimize their tax rather than how they can maximize their profits. So that's a, a nasty situation. Of course, also, um, people are unhappy about paying tax, especially when they read Mr. Paul's new book. Mr. Paul is a, an investigative journalist, and he throws new light on the road unit, on these uh, payments that were made to Mr. Zuma. Um, so it, it tends to make people less willing to pay tax. Then, of course, thirdly, the, uh, the economy is only going to grow at about 0.7 of a percent this year instead of the 1.2 percent that was projected in Provin Gordon's budget in February. That will obviously result in lower tax revenue. But it's virtually inevitable. And that in turn has an impact on the level of interest rates and on the RAND. The RAND has, has collapsed back to uh, as low as 14 Rand 20. You may remember that uh, I did mention this in last month's confidential report. Now let's just have a look at the RAND because I think that's probably the next thing that we actually need to talk about. So here I've drawn a chart of the RAND and I've put on some trend lines. This bottom trend line here is the long term trend which we used to call the Zuma line. Uh, and, of course, that was broken quite convincingly after Prabhupada Gordon was appointed as Minister of Finance. You can see the trend which he caused, which lost for the year that he was in office. That's where he was appointed. This is where he was fired. Since, he's been fi uh, since he was fired, we've had a series of weakening bottoms here. And the RAND, I said uh, in one of my articles and also uh, in the notes for the confidential report that if the RAND fell below 1360, then a new weakening trend was almost certain. We've now definitely gone through that. We're now at about 14 Rand, somewhere around the 14 Rand or above 14 Rand to the US dollar. And I think that you should, as private investors, remodel your investment strategy along the lines of a weakening RAND. And obviously that means that you've got to look at the RAND hedge component of the shares which interest you. In other words, to what extent do these shares receive some or all of their income 
in a foreign currency, preferably a hard currency, which will protect you against the collapse elective conference. I personally don't hold out great hopes for that elective conference. I think that uh, we're going to be disappointed there and the RAND will weaken further as a result. So the real hope now lies with the 2019 election. And that election will be conducted by the Electoral Commission, which is a Chapter 9 organization in terms of our Constitution. That organization is run by a chap called Sai Mamabolo. Sai Mamabolo, that is an important name for every South African to remember. He is the person who's in charge there, and he's the one who will make sure that we have free and fair elections as we have had in the past. Hopefully he is immune to political influence. He has been with the Electoral Commission for about 20 years. He has a lot of experience. He was involved in the 2014 and 2016 elections. Okay, let's now turn our attention to Wall Street. Um, and I'd like to obviously start by looking at the S&P 500. Um, I'll just go back and take a look at the 10-year chart to give you the context. Here you see the great bull market which we've been tracking. There's the first correction on the 3rd of October 2011 at 1100, the S&P at 1100. Here the second correction on the 10th uh, of February 2015 at 1862. Since then, the trend has been accelerating. I'm going to zoom in just on the end part of the chart now, show you the last year. You can see here this trend line, which is accelerating, and then even another trend line, which accelerates even further. So there's a process of acceleration. Now let's just zoom in in the last six months. And you can see here, the other day we had what was called a, what is called a bearish engulfing pattern. I've circled it in red so that you can see it and identify it in the future. When you have a candle like this, big red candle, which completely engulfs the previous day's candle, that is called a bearish engulfing pattern, and it's normally followed by a downtrend. But candlestick charting doesn't tell you how far that downtrend will go. In this case, it really just lasted for two days. The second day, we had something which approached a hammer formation in candlestick charting. I'll explain that in more detail later on in the seminar. And then obviously since then we've had a resurgence of bullish sentiment. The index has made a new record, all-time record high, and this accelerated trend appears to be holding for the moment at least. Obviously we're getting very close to the top trend line here, the upper channel line of the long-term bull trend. Uh, it will be very interesting to see if that channel line is penetrated. If it is penetrated, it definitely will signal an acceleration of the S&P 500. Obviously, this rise in the S&P 500 is really being driven by two things. Well, primarily by earnings, obviously, the profits that the S&P 500 companies are making in America. But predominantly, that is technology shares and health-related shares, pharmaceutical companies. That is where the big profits are being made. And that is where profits are exceeding analysts' forecasts. And we're talking here in the technology area about companies like Apple, which recently passed a market capitalization of a trillion dollars. And also um, companies like Tesla, which are quite amazing in terms of the technologies which they are exploiting and which have just recently produced excellent results which outperformed analyst expectations. Disruptive technologies, technologies which change the structure of the economy. Now obviously Apple is at the forefront of that, but Tesla is not far behind with their, with their batteries and their electric cars. And uh, Elon Musk is busy plan planning his first trip to Mars. Uh, which he says will take place in 2022. I mean, this is amazing. In five years' time, he is telling us that he will have a manned station on Mars. Uh, how he manages to do all these things, I'm not really quite sure. These disruptive technologies, uh, there are many of them, but one I just want to draw attention to, and I've, I've put more in the notes on this subject, is this concept of a blockchain. 
The big problem with digital databases is that they tend to be easily interfered with. They can be easily copied and people can hack into them and so on. Now blockchain overcomes that problem because it duplicates that database on many different servers, sometimes thousands of different servers. So you have the same information carried on all these databases. So obviously a hacker can hack one database and change or mess with it, but he cannot hack all of them. And they are constantly confirming each other. That is what blockchain is. So this means it's possible to have a completely reliable register of assets on the international servers of the world. Now if you think about it, many of your assets are held on registers. For example, if you own a property, then you have title deeds which are registered in Pretoria at the title deeds registry and nobody can duplicate them, so you can't have two title deeds for the same property. Nobody can, without your permission, take your title deeds and sell them without your permission. So that is what we do. We have government registries which manage a register to ensure that our assets, the documents which represent our assets like title deeds, are secure and we can trust them. The same is obviously true for the share market. We have straight which has a very, very carefully guarded register of all the owners of shares in listed companies in South Africa. That registry is updated thousands of times a day and straight balances it back to the actual transactions every single day and in fact more frequently than that. So that registry is also very important but theoretically both of those registries could be replaced by a blockchain database as could our electoral registry, the register of all the registered voters in South Africa. So it opens a new era of technology where the old system of having a registry which is guarded and protected and run by the government is replaced by a registry which no one runs but which is completely beyond any interference. So that will obviously be cheaper more trustworthy because there's no officials there to get it wrong or to be, uh, how can we say, politically motivated, etc. Anyway, I'm just drawing your attention to these disruptive technologies because I think they are going to have a huge impact on our lives and also on the stock market and good shares are likely to do better. Another factor which has been driving Wall Street recently, of course, is the prospect of the Trump tax reforms. Now, it's been estimated that if his reforms go through, they will save somewhere between, they will reduce taxes, they're somewhere between 25 and 35 percent, and that will, that will impact the companies trading on the S&P 500 to the extent of $10 of earnings per share on average over the 500 companies in the S&P. The effect of an increase of $10 in the S&P 500 company's earnings will be to drive the S&P 500 up to $2,700. So you can see here on this chart, uh, we're looking at the S&P 500 now. It's trading at $2,575. A little while ago, on this day, just a few days ago, it made a new all-time record high at about $2,582. I expect it to break that high quite soon. But if it goes to 2700, that is a massive jump forward. Obviously, it's more than 100 points up. Of course, in November last year, we wrote an article about the point and figure horizontal count method of forecast, forecasting where the trend will go. And our prediction was that the S&P 500 would go to at least 3027. And considering it's at 2575 right now, that is a massive move forward. And we believe that even that is conservative. In other words, what we're looking at here is a, a, a great bull market. And while I'm on that subject, 
There's only been one bull market in the history of the S&P 500 which has been bigger than this one that we're in right now. And that, was the S that is the bull market of 1991 to 1998, also called the, uh, sub the, the uh, uh, dot com boom, the dot com boom, which came to an abrupt end in 1998 and the market fell away from that. That particular bull market, which lasted for eight years, took the S&P 500 up 302%. This bull market is just 7% away from that. And it will reach the same level and surpass it when it gets to 2717. And then it will be the greatest of all time. The Americans call that GOAT, the greatest of all time. So it will be the greatest bull market in recorded history since the Second World War. Of course, our belief is that that is a, a foregone conclusion. It will definitely go up to those levels and way beyond those levels. We believe that it will reach GOAT, the greatest of all time, sometime next year, probably June. That would be a reasonable expectation. Of course, Mr. Soros, George Soros, the well-known investment professional who manages billions of dollars of people's money, um, believed that 2017 would be very similar to 2008 when the subprime crisis first hit. And uh, so last year, in about November, he took a short position on ETFs which concentrate on investing in the S&P 500 companies. He took two positions there. In March this year, he decided that uh, if it was a short in November last year, it was even more of a short in March this year, so he doubled up his position. So he now has billions of dollars worth of shorts. Every uh, quarter, he has to file a, a report, um, which is called uh, a, a 13F report, and in that report, he has to disclose what his short positions are. The August one demonstrated that he still had his short positions. So we'll have to wait now until November to see whether he held them through this period. But he must be beginning, be beginning to feel like the Christian scientist, you know, with the appendicitis. There really is nowhere for him to go. He must have lost billions of dollars on this short position. Okay, let's now move on to the JSC overall index. So, I want to have a look at what's happening on our stock market now. So, let's quickly take a look there. There you can see the pattern which I drew your attention to a while back. I've drawn in a, a uh, support and resistance line. As you can see, uh, we were bumping our head against this line for some time over the last couple of years. We finally broke through over here. Uh, this would be in July. Since then, uh, we've come back and tested it. So you see how the, the resistance line over here becomes the support line once it's broken. So the market came back, tested it twice, and then broke to the upside. And as you can see, we're now following the international markets up very strongly, which is what I predicted. Uh, we also did a, a point and figure horizontal count on the uh, JSC overall index um, a little while ago and we reported on that in one of our articles. You can go back and have a look. And in that we predicted that from this trend line, this horizontal trend line here, the JSC overall index would go up at least 38%. Obviously some of that will come from recovering uh, commodity prices and some of it will come from the big rand head shares in the market. And in fact, it is the RAND head shares, the overseas shares, which are trading on the JSC, which are driving the market up, primarily. So we're talking about shares like AV Embed, British American Tobacco, NASPES, those kind of companies which are traded internationally and obviously are picking up the bullish sentiment that we see on the S&P 500. But also those shares offer you a RAND hedge, so that also helps as the RAND weakens, they get stronger and stronger. The rising JSC uh, contradicts what is happening in the economy, does it not? I mean, our economy seems to be in a desperate situation. 
we read nothing but negative bad news in the newspaper every day. Uh, there's always another Gupta scandal or another revelation of corruption. And yet our oil market index is going up to record highs almost every day now. So it just shows you, the stock market anticipates what will happen in the economy by 9 months to 18 months, somewhere in that gap. So what this is telling you is that the smart investors, both local and international, are busy buying up JSE listed companies so that they can benefit from an economic boom which they expect to begin sometime in the next 18 months, but probably late next year, that would be the expectation. It's also interesting to compare the JSE overall index with other indexes. So, you know, you've got the JSE uh, top 40, the all 40, right? Which looks very similar to the chart on the screen because it's got all those big companies in it. So if I just take a look at that, and I'll put the same uh, data. You can see it also went in a sideways pattern for a long time and then broke to the upside. You can see that. You can also picture in your mind the, the uh, horizontal line that I drew on here which became the resistance at these two points and then we've got the upside break. Now this is obviously the 40 biggest companies trading on the JSC. The next 60 biggest after these 40 are in the index called the JSE Midcap, okay? MIDC, it's JSE-MIDC in the software. So let's take a look at that. Alright, again I'm going to compress this and put 5 years data. You can see that the mid-cap has been going up, but recently has been trending down. Until the last 5 or 6 months. Then we've had a series of new higher lows. Let's just zoom out that a bit. You can see there's a low there. The bottom point here was at the beginning of July. Then in October we had a higher low than that and we've recently had an even higher low and we're now breaking to the upside out of it. My expectation is that the mid-cap index will follow the JSC top 40 upward and the JSC overall index upward. The same pattern can also be seen in the small cap index which is JSC-SM on your software. And again here you can see just going to get it on the screen. You can see here a sort of broad island formation, a base point over there, and then rising bottoms as the new trend takes hold. So the message from this is that you should be in the stock market right now. You should be invested in the share market. I now like to spend a little bit of time looking at uh, one of our mistakes. Okay, um, With all our experience in the stock market, we still make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And I'm talking, of course, about Long for Life, uh, the Brian Joffrey Company. We wrote an article about this way back in uh, May this year and advocated that we should invest in this company. Uh, this is a startup operation set up by Brian Joffrey, who was well known from, uh, from his days at Bidvest as the CEO. He built that company up into a massive company. So using his name, he represents. A little while later, the, market, the share fell quite heavily, and so we doubled up our investment over here. And we, we managed to reduce our average cost from 650 to 633 cents. Obviously, that average cost is what you work your stop loss for. So that's why it's so important. We had a brief flurry where they're sharing up to 790 here when they bought Hold Sport, but that didn't last long, and it came all the way back down and it was, it's been moving sideways since then, at, at the sort of 5 to 6 rand area. Came down, came down, came down, and finally we stopped out of the share over here on that day. We got 5 rand 80 for our shares, and we made a significant loss there, about a 5% loss actually overall. Since then, the market has fallen quite a long way, and yesterday the share reached a low of 501 cents. So that shows that our decision to stop out over here on, uh, on the uh, 3rd of October was a correct decision. And obviously, the reason I'm showing you this is because it's an object lesson in investment on the share market. You must have a stop loss strategy, you must be strict about your stop loss strategy, you must implement it. The only option you have if the share falls through your stop loss or through your stop loss 
is to do what we did earlier, which is to increase your holding at that lower level, thereby bring down your average cost, which will also bring down your, your stop loss level, but of course it increases your exposure to the share. So those are the considerations, and if you have to think of through before you get into the situation. Once you pass through that stop loss level, it is very difficult psychologically to apply it later. So, you know, with all our experience here at the company, uh, we make mistakes. That's the message you need to get from us. Everybody makes mistakes. Even the smartest investor makes mistakes from time to time. I reckon that out of, out of 10 stock market picks, I will get maybe 7 or 6 right. Which means that I know I'm always going to have 3 or 4 dogs out of those 10 shares. And that doesn't concern me because I know that I'm very strict about my stop loss strategy and the very worst that can happen to me is that I can lose 15% on that investment and that by the way includes my dealing cost. So, so my stops are never set more than 12% out. That's the message. Make it your philosophy. Make a vow that you will never lose more than 15% on any stock market investment ever including your dealing costs. And then set about point, pegging your stop loss levels at the appropriate point so that that is true. Because if you never lose more than 15% but you can make 100, 200, 300 or 400 percent on a successful investments, you have to be successful in the stock market. Okay, let's look at another share. I want to go to a share called CarTrack now. Um, CarTrack is a company involved in tracking devices. You probably have some of these tracking devices. You have these tracking devices on your car right now. So they get a small fee from thousands and thousands of people who own motor cars, and they have a, a basically a cell phone technology which enables them to track your vehicle wherever it goes, and in some cases even to stop it, to physically stop the vehicle so it cannot be driven any further. And then they have a recovery service, which if the car's been stolen, they go out and recover your vehicle. They do a lot of fleet management software. It's a very interesting company. And, and they, have, they have businesses in South Africa, of course, which is where they started. But they've spread out to Southeast Asia. And they have businesses in Europe and in America. So this is a company which is very interesting to me. Um, I, I like it. Their, their most recent... Uh, Figures for the six months to the end of August showed their turnover up 14% and headline earnings per share up 20%, which is great. This is a great small company uh, on the JSC, which I think has got a wonderful uh, future. It's tightly held, and obviously that means that there are not a lot of shares being traded, so you have to bear in mind your volume limitations when buying a share. But aside from that, I think it's a good investment. Let's take a look at Rolfs. Now Rolfs is a very different operation. It's been around for a lot longer. It's a specialized chemicals business. And they, they sell chemicals, all sorts of different chemicals, to a variety of industries in South Africa. They had a bit of a problem recently because their financial director resigned and there's a bit of a scandal going on there. They had to restate their financial statements. Um, so it was all a bit embarrassing, and they're busy trying to recover from it. But in the year to June this year, their turnover was up 10%, and their headline earnings per share about 8%. They will obviously benefit from any recovery in the South African economy. The share price has fallen to a low here, as you can see here, of about 200 cents. Uh, and it's now very close to the net asset value of the company. We believe that there is some support developing at this level. So we're urging you to watch the share and put it on your watch list and have a look at it. Because you can see this is what we call an island formation that is, is developing over here. Obviously, we need to see an upside breakout out of that island. So it's got to go above this candle and above that candle for you to get an upside breakout. But that would be what you were looking for. The next share that I want to look at is a company called WG Worm. This is not a company that you're often going to see uh, talked about in South Africa or quoted. It's actually a very uh, sad story, all in all. There is its entire history since it was listed in 2006. But the listed period 
only shows the most recent part of their history. W.G. Wern was actually started in 1910, so it's one of the oldest companies on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. They listed in 2006, and at first they were very optimistic, things were very bullish, but obviously when we had the 2008 subprime crisis, they went through a massive collapse. Now they supply aggregates for the construction industry, and that explains why the share fell like this. In, uh, in, uh, after the 2008 subprime crisis. It doesn't explain why the shares continued to fall all the way through here. It fell, in this initial fall, it fell to about 40 cents a share. It is now trading for about 14 cents and it's been as low as 4 or 5 cents a share, even 3 cents a share. The reason I'm showing you the share is not because I want you to rush out and buy it. I want to show it to you because it shows, again, the extreme importance of having a stop loss strategy. You can imagine, somebody out there bought these shares for around 600 cents. If they're still holding the share, they've got a share which is trading for 14 cents and which has been down to a low of 3 cents. How can that make sense to anyone? I mean, it's just crazy to sit in a share and watch your losses mount up. You're like the rabbit in the headlines. You know you're going to die, but you don't move. In the share market, being successful is not so much about making money as it is about not losing it. Alright, now let's look at another share, PPC, something a little bit more optimistic. Pretoria Portland Cement has been much in the news lately. And that is because this, this great company, which is, which is uh, part of our history in South Africa and which is a massive company in the construction industry, the primary supplier of cement in South Africa, and which is opening branches and new plants throughout Africa in four different African countries right now. But like all the construction companies, they have fallen on hard times, and the share price has plunged from a high of about 33 rand a share. Let me just put a bit more history on here, uh, even a bit more than that. There you can see it. it was 32 rand a share here in September 2014. We went all the way down to 3 rand 50, this V bottom that I'm pointing out down here. V bottoms, by the way, are quite unusual in the share market and often signal a significant turnaround. Obviously, PPC has been the subject of a number of takeover bids. Uh, the first one came from AfriSan, and uh, I don't really think it was a realistic bid. It undervalues uh, PPC quite considerably. Then we got, uh, a couple of days ago, a new bid from Lafarge Wholesome, which is the biggest, one of the biggest cement suppliers in the world. They supply millions of tons, 386 million tons of cement a year. And they're looking to buy out this company and possibly just the African assets of PPC. But obviously that will increase the value. In our opinion, the share, which is now trading at around 7 rand a share, is worth at least 10 million. We do not think that the AfriSan deal will go through. And given the V bottom here, we, we feel that this share represents good value at the current level. Okay, let's turn our attention to Sasol. I've looked at this share on a number of occasions over the years. Um, so those of you who have been uh, regular at, at these webinars and reading my articles and so on, will be familiar with this chart here that I'm going to put on the screen. As you can see here, the, the massive rise in the price of Sasol over the years. Then we had the, uh, a double top here from a technical point of view, almost perfect double top. And then in the late second half of had a massive impact. And of course we're talking about the oil price falling from around $150 a barrel to somewhere around $50 a barrel. Actually, at first it felt $28 a barrel. And then it recovered to around where it is now, around $50 a bar. As you can see, Sasol found support here at 360 rand a share and resistance at 490. And it's basically been trading in that range ever since about uh, the end of, well, from 2015 onwards, from the beginning of 2015 onwards. So for a few years. Now, one of the things that will have an impact on Sasol will be the collapse of the RAND because a lot of their business is overseas and clearly the oil price in RANDs is what they have to deal with. 
So they're being protected to some extent from the collapsing oil price by the weakness in the rand. But they've got a big problem. They've got a, a, a black economic empowerment program which is just coming to an end. It's called Nzalo. Nzalo. And in order to, obviously with the fall in the share price, that has wiped off a lot of the value from that BEE scheme. And they now, they then proposed that they would issue 43 million Sassol shares, new Sassol shares, in order to raise capital to, to bring this BEE problem uh, back into balance. And so that they could commence a new BEE scheme called Kanisa. The shareholders were very unhappy about this, I must tell you. I mean, obviously, the 43 million shares would dilute their existing shareholders, shareholdings quite substantially, actually by about 6%. BEE schemes are a big problem in South Africa because they're made, they're made necessary by the various charters. So every industry has a charter now in terms of the broad-based black economic empowerment Act. They've all got to have charters. And we're familiar with the mining charter, which is now uh, a big subject of discussion and arguments and even court battles. There's one in the financial industry and so on and so forth. So these people, these big companies, are required to have, in terms of the charter, a certain percentage of black shareholders. And uh, this is a, a headache for them because they then, they issued, in the initial schemes, they issued these shares. And uh, the uh, black people took them up, but as soon as they realized they could sell these shares and get money from them, they sold that shareholder. The result of that was that the company's uh, black shareholding diminished from the, the amount required, the percentage required in the charter, and so they then had to do another scheme um, to bring it back up to, to scratch. Uh, this led to a new a uh, situation where companies issued a special class of shares for black people and that class was in all respects the same as the existing shares except that it had to be sold. If you wanted to sell them, you could only sell them to another black person. That was the requirement. And the JSC actually set up a special BEE board to carry these shares. The problem is, of course, that because they could only be sold to black people, there was very little market for them. And their share price fell as a result. I mean, the price of a share is obviously determined by the number of people you can buy. If you have a bigger market for your shares, the price will obviously be higher. So they traded at a discount to the other ordinary shares, and that is, has been a huge problem in South Africa. It shows that you cannot interfere with a free market like the JSC and have a successful result. Inevitably, all right, let's look at Mondi now. Now, Mondi is one of our great South African companies, been around for years and years, listed on the JSC for years and years. They are a paper and packaging company, and uh, they have spread out into the rest of the world. Um, I just want to show here the, the wonderful bull trend which Mondi is in. You can see I've drawn a trend line. We've also, if you zero in on this last little part here, you can see we've got one of those island formations. Um, it's actually, if I can move that across here, over here, you can see it starts there, it moves across there. When you see the shares off quite heavily like this, it represents a buying opportunity in our view. They've got very strong growth in the September quarter. They produced a profit after tax of 245 million euros. You can translate that into, into rands. That was 8% up on the same quarter last year. And obviously they're benefiting substantially from growth in the European economy. And uh, obviously I will point out again the strong bull chain which Mondi is in that you should look to take advantage of. Okay, let's look at Richemont. Richemont, of course, is separated out the overseas element. They mainly do uh, luxury goods, watches and pens and things like that overseas. Um, they're benefiting from the bull trend in overseas markets and also from the fact that they're a great land hedge. We think the bull trend will continue. And so we draw your attention to Richmond and say that this is the kind of share you need to buy if you want a good land hedge. 
Okay, let's look at a much smaller company than that. It's a company called Gaia. Okay, this is listed on the Alt X. A little company. I'm just going to put all the data on the screen so that you can see the whole thing since they were listed. As you can see from this sort of Lego block chart here, I'm actually going to take it to a price chart. You can see it much more easily. You see this kind of square pattern in a closing price chart. When you see that, you know that the share is thinly traded. Okay? There's not a lot of volume here. And in fact, if we put on a volume chart here, let's go down here and put on a volume, you'll see that many days there's no volume. And one of the great features of your software is that you can put a moving average on here. So I can click on this little button here in the bottom left hand corner of the screen and I can put on a 30 day moving average on there in red. And I just click OK and then you can see the 30 day moving average. And if I go up here and turn on this data window and come and look down here, you can see there that on a simple, the simple moving average we put on shows that this share trades about 3,000 shares a day on average on the stock market. 3,000 shares, right? On, and it's done that for the past 30 days. So if we now come here to the most recent day and we see that the share trades for about 8 grand 35, and we say 3,000 shares times 8 grand 35, this share is trading somewhere around 30,000 rands worth of shares a day. That's the average. So that means that for a private investor who wants to put in, say, 10,000 rand, this share is applicable. You could buy this share. Now, what does Gaia do? They invest in wind farms. They bought two wind farms already, and they pay out very good dividends. If you look here at the dividend deal, it's actually difficult to show you this, but the dividend deal is now, if you look at the top right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see there it's at... 8.46. So they're paying out about 8.3% dividend yield. So on a, on a share price of 83 cents, 835 cents, they paid out a dividend last year of 88.5 cents. That's a very good dividend. Obviously, the, the share is very thinly traded because there are no institutional buyers. There are no institutional buyers. So, so the, the institutional buyers are not there. Why? Because there's no volume traded. But that offers you, as a private investor, an opportunity to buy this very interesting company at these levels on such a good dividend deal. Believe me, if Standard Bank was trading on a dividend deal of 8.3%, the big institutions would be, would be buying it up left, right and center. But this company, they, they simply can't buy into it because they, they cannot get the volume of shares that they want to. But you, as a private investor, you see, sometimes in the share market, small is beautiful. And bear in mind one other thing about this company. It's got a net asset value of a thousand and sixty-three cents. So you're buying a thousand and sixty-three cents worth of net assets and you're paying eight hundred and thirty-five cents for them. That sounds like a good deal. Okay, let's look at another share which I think is very interesting. And then here and get rid of these nasty vertical lines, which I don't like, uh, if you have the option of eliminating, and then I want to see it in a candlestick chart. Now. There you can see it's a candlestick chart, and then I'm going to put all the data on that we've got. So there you can see plenty of cushion. As you can see, this company listed on the stock market a few years ago, in 2012. They are in the fishing business, obviously, and they are quite thinly traded, as you will have observed. And that is because, again, they have very little institutional interest. The big institutions, the pension would be too small to be significant for them. But this little company, which, as I said, is it's worth about a billion rand total. That's the market cap. They just bought another company called Tal Harbor. Tal and they bought 53% of it, which gives them control, of course. And that company, in the most recent tax year to August, produced an after-tax profit of 51 million rand, which is a nice after-tax profit. They paid, for their 53.5% of that company, 106 million rand, which means that they bought it on a multiple of roughly four. In other words, they got 53% of 51 million rand. Let's say, for argument, that's about 26 million rand. 
and they paid 106 million for that 26 million, right? So that if you divide the, the, 100, the, the 106 million that they paid by the 26 million, which is the most recent after-tax profits of this company, you'll see they paid four times the most recent after-tax profits. We call that the multiple or the price earnings ratio. But the important thing to understand about PFB, as it's called, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong share on the screen. I need to press PF. I do apologize for that. That's why it wasn't nice and cleaned up. So here's Premier Efficient. Let's put all the data on the screen. And here you can see it listed, as I said, at about 500 cents a share um, a little while ago uh, in March. Sorry, please disregard a little of what I said there. But you can see the shares come down and it's trading at about 385 cents a share. But the interesting thing is, if you look at the PE, you'll see it's on a price earnings ratio of 11. So now, that means that by buying Tal Harbor, they got 26 million rands worth of extra earnings, and they paid four times that, but now that those earnings will be added to their profits, they will be revalued to 11 times. Can you see what's going on here? They paid four times, and now those earnings are revalued to 11 times. This is a very good thing to do. This company that they bought, Talhada, does uh, squid fishing around Port Elizabeth, um, and it's a successful company, obviously, because they produce nice profits. What I'm trying to point out is how a listed company can use its share capital to buy another company which is not listed at a very low PE and then revalue its earnings to its PE on the share market. Unlisted companies, private companies which are not listed on the stock exchange, generally trade on a PE of between 2 and 5. Listed companies can trade on a PE of anything between 10 and 20. As you can see, this one's on a PE right now of 11.13, and a little while ago it was on a PE of 15. So, in my view, uh, they are going to score a big bonanza here. They also are newly listed, and they spun off Premier Fishing. And as you can see, their share price is climbing quite nicely. Why is it climbing? Because they don't only have one company to list. They're going to spin off another company called AYO, AYO, next year. And that company is twice as big as Premier Fishing. It's got a market cap of roughly 2 billion rand. You can see what's happening. They are, they are taking advantage of this, the very early stage of what I described as a possible listings boom in my last confidential report. More and more companies are coming to the market and listing, and you can see the benefit, because then they can use their highly rated shares to buy other companies at a much lower price earnings ratio, and then revalue their earnings up to the higher level. And they make an immediate capital gain. And you also, as a shareholder, will, know, will, will make that same capital gain. Okay, now I see I've been talking for an awfully long time. So I, I, I want to call this uh, session to a close and just say that uh, there will be one more um, uh, confidential report and webinar that goes with it in December, uh, around the uh, first Wednesday in December. And um, so and then we will have a break until February. So there will not be one in January. So there will be one in December and then the next one will be in February. Please also go and look for the notes on the website and click through to the notes because they can carry a lot more detail than I've been able to cover in this webinar. I do apologize for going on and on and on, but there was a lot to cover in this, in this particular webinar. Thank you for listening to me.